So today we're going to finish the 10th chapter of Igeras HaTshuva. And to recap, in the 10th chapter of Igeras HaTshuva, the Alter Rebbe speaks about the concept of Tshuva Ilov, the higher form of Tshuva, which is not about regretting or necessarily experiencing bitterness and remorse over past failings, but rather the concept of experiencing a deeper sense of closeness with Hashem. That's, that's what the notion of Tshuva Ilov is. Before Pedic Yud, we spoke about this in the terms of Torah study and in terms of, of, of uh, perhaps Gimel's Chasodri. But here, the emphasis is specifically on prayer, on davening. And al Rebbe explained how and why Tefillah represents the notion of Tshuva Ilov, a deeper sense of cleaving and closeness to Hashem. And this, of course, presented us with a very interesting situation. Because if tshuva, ilah, and prayer are synonymous, then we know that tshuva, ilah, the higher form of tshuva, has to be preceded by tshuva, tata, the lower form of tshuva. And the question is, where do we see that in our davening? And al Rebbe went on to explain that this is textbook. It fits perfectly with, with what the Mishnah says, as, as uh, we're on the second page, in the old numbers of, of the print, it's 198. So the Alter Rebbe says, this is exactly what a rabbi said in the Mishnah, in Endim Lespalo, Ela Mitech Kevidresh. A person should not pray, save out of seriousness or heaviness of head. So in that serious mood, that Kevidresh, Upirish Rashi, Rashi explains the Mishnah that it means Hachna, a sense of humility, and a sense of self abnegation. This is the lower level of tshuva, to awaken and to arouse mercy. As you mentioned earlier, like the Gemara said, how do we know how to daven, how do we know how to pray? We take a look at biblical precedent and we identify the prayers of Chana, the mother of Shmuel Hanavi, and that the, the Kohen Gadol Eli thought that, that she was drunk, but he also thought that the Torah the describes her as being Maras Nefesh, she was bitter of soul. From this we know we daven silently, we know we, 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 how the posture was supposed to assume, and we also know that she was maras nefesh, that she was embittered. And since that's described in the scripture as part and parcel of a prayer, then this tells us the notion of davening has to be preceded by the concept of maras nefesh. We kind of got here last week. Ochein, having said all this, the b'raisa shom and the b'raisa, which is the codicil of the Mishnah, that's considered to be of the same genre and the same importance of the Mishnah. Torah Rabbanon, our rabbis learned, named him Lispalel, Elo Mitech Simcha, that a person has to set himself up for prayer out of a state of joy. And this creates an obvious issue, a, 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 a seeming contradiction. What should it be? Should you be Mispalel Mitech Kevid which is contrite, to be shriveled up in oneself, to feel small, to feel inadequate, to feel that we fall short, to feel awed before the Almighty, but we should be in a state of joy. And joy comes along with expansiveness, and joy comes along with self-expression, and joy comes along with self-confidence, and joy comes along with self-esteem. It feels good. Joy is a good feeling. When a person's happy about something, they feel good about themselves. When a person's in a state of bitterness, in a state of contriteness, in a state where they're, they're ashamed, they're embarrassed of, 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 of the circumstances, they don't feel good about themselves. <coughs> Quite to the contrary. They're really opposite of polar emotions. And here we have the Mishnah telling us one thing, the Braisa telling us something else. Both have to be true. And the question is how does this work out? So this is what today's focus is going to be on, achieving what we call emotional equilibrium. How is it possible for a person to be at once in a state of meridus, in a state of maras nefesh, in a state of kavid resh, in a state of seriousness, heavy heartedness, feeling small and shriveled, shamed and embarrassed, and at the same time, for a person to feel joyous, elated, expansive of spirit, and so on and so forth. So, al Rebbe doesn't really tell you how to do it. He just notes that the Bedur Yosem Hazer, in this orphan generation, there's <laughs> very few people are capable of experiencing such polar emotions in immediate turnaround. Like go from one extreme to the other. Most people have an acclimatization. They kind of 
you know, they wean themselves away from one reality and they slowly get themselves into a better mood. But to be in a state of deep, deep, of deep seriousness, of, of deep, I don't say sadness because that's a, a negative emotion altogether, but a state of deep bitterness, a state of deep self abnegation and shame. And then to be able to turn around in a moment and to experience an extraordinary and elevated state of joy, it's not possible. We, 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 we can't do that. So maybe there was great tzaddikim who were capable of doing this, experiencing these extreme emotions, but the average person cannot experience that in, in, the, the, in what they call in Hebrew, bin rega, just like with the, at the, the blink of an eye or, or, or in a snap. So it's interesting, there's, there's, um, in certain manuscripts it says that when we talk about the concept of, of uh, Avedis Hashem, that there's things we can learn from a child. And a child is capable of experiencing one extreme emotion, and then a moment later, another extreme emotion. And they go from one extreme to the other. The child can throw a tantrum and be, be angry and be frustrated. And a moment later, the child's laughing and joking and he's happy. So the truth is, if we see an adult acting like a child, we think something's wrong with him. And something probably is, because the child does it with abandon. It's not a, it's not a sophisticated and mature kind of emotion. The child is just prone to extremes. That's, that's the nature of a child. Then we get older, we become calibrated, we become like, like logical and reasonable people. So logical, reasonable people don't throw tantrums and then be, are delighted a moment later. In general, we don't throw tantrums, but this, this notion of extreme extremities and extreme expressions of emotion is something which works in a childlike reality. It doesn't really fit for mature and, 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 and balanced people. So why would, why would Sadiq speak about that? Like what's, what, what, what's, what's the point of it? It's not really connected, maybe directly, but to me, there's there's not a there's a link between the two. Many years ago, I learned that it says tinik mishanolad, a child from the moment he's born, maskele is yabish. He begins, I guess, the literal translation is to dry out. <coughs> it begins to be weakened. Tinik mishanolad, maskele is yabish. Okay, fine. So I didn't, I never understood this. I didn't understand it because the reality is a child is very weak and a child gets stronger and stronger as they get older. In fact, the Mishnah says that you continue to wax in strength until the age of 30. So you're usually stronger at 30 than you were at the age of 20. So, and then you start to peak. It says, you uh, may say, so at the age of 35 or 40, you start to downward descent. You start, people start getting weaker, metabolism slows down and so on and so forth. But you're getting stronger up until a point, right? Like life is like, you know, you start off on the bottom and you move your way up as the zenith of life, and then you slowly move your way down in, into the declining end of life. The question then is, how could we understand this with the notion of tindik mishanoila, that a child from the moment he's born, maskal is yabish, that's a dry right away. So it always bothered me, I didn't understand it. So, there was a, a certain time that I had a, a, a surgery, and my son had the same surgery. Uh, just to repair a hernia. And, and like I knew it took me like weeks to recover, to get back to myself. I, I think my surgery was Thursday night. I pushed myself to go to Shul. I was in Shul Shabbos. I had delivered a sermon. I was totally knocked out after that. And, it, and it's, it takes, and my, and my grandfather had a surgery at the same time. So he was sick for like three and a half months. He couldn't move for like months. <laughs> till, till he got back, the delivery took months. Me, it took weeks. My son, Seven hours later, was on a, 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 a what's it called? Not a skateboard, a, a scooter. <laughs> Somebody bought him a scooter. He's on a scooter. I'm like, you can't do that. He says, why not? <laughs> <laughs> and the level of recovery was just extraordinary. The, the incision healed. He got back to his strength. It was literally a matter of days. And I saw a child of seven was a matter of days. Uh, uh, um, I was probably, I don't know, my late 30s then was a matter of weeks. And my grandfather in the 70s was a matter of months. And then I understood the meaning of Tinnit Mishanayla, Maskal Yabash. You know, we talk about stem cells. We talk about the, the, the way the, the structure, the cellular structure of, 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 a, of a fetus is so malleable that, that the, 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 the stem cells could become anything. But as we get older, we get hardened. And like whatever's one cell belongs to one part of the body or one organism, it, it stays there. And you can't like move it around in the same way because children have a certain elasticity. And the elasticity allows them to adapt and allows them to heal and allows them to bounce back in a way that adults simply don't have. So I think that this is the meaning of maskele yabesh, that you start to lose elasticity. The older you get, the less elastic you become, the more brittle you become. So 
if this is if it's this way in a bodily sense, in a material sense, in a corporeal sense, it's probably like that also in a spiritual sense, in an emotional sense. That is to say that emotionally, children could experience extreme emotions, and it's not a problem. The, the elasticity within the realm of emotion, the possibility of emotions, that a child could be so angry, and a moment later so happy, and so sad, and so elated, that's, that's the nature of a child's personality. But as we get older, we get uh, more brittle, if you will. And, and we get stuck in emotions. We get, people get stuck in emotional spaces, especially these days. People like, like uh, off the charts with their emotions. And, 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 and they can't function. And PS, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, is a real, it's a real issue. It's not a little thing. It's a real thing. It's a, it's, 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 it's a, it's a serious disabler of functionality. And you have to deal with it. We have, to, we have to deal with trauma and deal with issues. And it would seem that the older one gets, the more one has an issue, the more one has to deal with this. It takes more time to be able to experience rehabilitation, to be able to come back to oneself. So, going back to what the Alta Rebbe speaks about here, speaks about the, the, uh, the, the notion that going from one extreme, being in a state of deep brokenheartedness, of deep sadness, of deep shame, scratch sadness, deep bitterness, and deep shame of, of one's inadequacies, of one's failings before Hashem, and then a moment later, to be in a state of great joy, that I have the opportunity to serve Hashem, that I'm able to speak to Hashem, that Hashem loves me, that my prayers are meaningful before, before the Almighty. To go from one extreme <coughs> to the other is something that people just can't experience that. There's a beautiful story told with, I think it was a Isaac of Hummel, who was a famous chassid of the Alter Rebbe, the Mittler Rebbe. He was sent on a mission to Rebbe Saul of Ruzhin. And he came there just before Shabbos. And he saw the Ruzhin Rebbe smoking a pipe. It was very common in those days. And it was right before Shabbos. And he couldn't believe it. He's smoking a pipe like a moment, moments, like it was literally Shkia. And he could see through the window of his study, and here he was with a pipe, and he could see the sun setting. And he was looking at a manuscript or at a, or at a sefer, and he saw the moment that the sun set, he saw the pipe fell out of his mouth, and he said if he had not seen with his own eyes the change in the face of Rabbi Sol Ruzhna to the moment before Shabbos had arrived, to the moment after Shabbos arrived, he would not believe it's humanly possible for a person to experience such transformation in a moment. In other words, an, a, a, the tzaddik is able to literally move himself from one reality into the next in the blink of an eye. But ordinary people can't do this. And this presents us with a problem. Prayer is supposed to be done joyfully. Prayer is true law. It's about feeling close to Hashem. It's about feeling happy and joyous about our relationship. That's what prayer is supposed to be. So prayer is the way we make up for sins, not by speaking about inadequacies, not by focusing on failings, not by being miserable about all the things we did wrong, but instead it's the idea of tshuva, of experiencing this full-blooded, full-throated, uh, full-hearted relationship with Hashem that brings us great joy. And a regular person can't go from one extreme to the other. So what should we do? So the Alter Rebbe says, he gives you, know, here's some advice. Azai, so then the, the advice is, So you'll start off your sad, your, not sadness, your bitterness and your frustration and your shame and, and, and the, 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 the sense of, of, of inadequacy. You'll start that off at at midnight, and then you have a couple of hours. So then you'll, be, you'll get through your misery at midnight, and by the time you're ready to dab and at six or seven o'clock in the morning, everything's fine. Hmm. Great idea, no? So now the day has to start. Instead of you waking for davening at 5.30 or 6, now you have to wake for davening at 12, at midnight. And then you'll experience all the moras nefesh, all the bitterness of the soul. And then when you finish mourning for the Beis Amigdash, which is what is proverbially supposed to be done, you wake up at midnight and cry for, cry for the golos, the exile of the Shechina. And then when you finish crying for that and, and being sad about that and being, and being bitter about that, so then you'll spend the rest of the night studying Torah, reciting Tillim. And in the morning... You'll already have been several hours away from your Tikkun Chatzos experience, you'll be ready for a state of joy. Okay, this maybe is practical in the hour, hour wise of making a distinction, a, a buffer between the Maras Nefesh, between the bitterness of soul, and between the joy one is supposed to experience in davening. However, totally impractical for most people. <coughs> most people do not have nine hours a day to invest in chakras, which means you're gonna get up at midnight, and most people are still getting to bed at midnight, not waking up at midnight. So, how's that going to work? 
Alta Rebbe says, okay, I know, I know. This, I could already hear all the uh, protests. <laughs> he says, Umishi, Yefshalei, Bechol Laila, a person who can't do this every single night, he says, I'll call upon him. So at the very least, La Yifches Me Pam Echad Beshvua. So at least once a week, you should do Tikkah Chatzais. At least once a week, Lefnei Yom HaShabbos, before the day of Shabbos comes. So this should be a preparation for Shabbos. Kinoida, as it's known, the Yedim, to those who know, Shah Shabbos, he bechinas Tshuvei Lov. That Shabbos is also the level of Tshuvei Lov. Shabbos is a feeling of closeness to Hashem, and a sense of joy, and a sense of spiritual rehabilitation. And Alter Rebbe says that Shabbos, Shin Beis Tov, is Oisius Toshev Enesh. Toshev means to return, and David Amel says, until him Toshev Enesh Adaka, so Toshev Enesh means the person returns, and since the person returns is the same letter as Shabbos, so Shabbos is about return. Shabbos is about restoration. Shabbos is about rejuvenation. Shabbos, Kibbe Shabbos, Yali Yisraelimus, and Shabbos, the whole world, is elevated, and I'll explain that in a moment. All right. So let's first talk about what the Alter Rebbe said here, and then try to understand it. The first thing he said is that we have to have meridus, we have to have the bitterness prior to davening in order to experience a proper davening. The next thing he said is, practically speaking, the change of emotions is not doable for most people. You have to be a really exalted soul to be able to pull that off. So the next thing he said was, at least you should do it several hours earlier. And this way you'll have time to move from the maras nefesh, from the bitterness, you have a couple of hours to readjust yourself and be in a state of great joy and an experience of proper davening. Then he said, most people can't pull that off. They're not ready to do this on a nightly uh, basis or a daily basis and, and get up at midnight and be able to organize themselves to have such success in every single, utilizing every single moment that they should have time to get up for chatzais and do tikkun chatzais and then do shakash properly. So what should you do? Rabbi, there's something that I, I don't fundamentally understand. The reason Hannah was in a state of bitterness is because she didn't have a child. Yes. So when she davened after she had Shmuel, she was in a state of bitterness. It's a very good question. Like, you know, it was her circumstances right. that led to that. So it's why a, would it's we a, deduce that it has to be that way all the time? It's a, it's a very good question. It's a question that bothered me also. So let me, let me re, uh, recap it. You're saying that we're learning from Chana, the Himaras Nefesh, that's a matter of fact. And we know why Chana was bitter. Yeah. So what does that have to do with us? I mean, do you know what Chana had for breakfast that day? Huh? <laughs> do you know what Chana had for breakfast the day that she was davening? Probably nothing. Why? She was in bitter spirits, like she didn't go to Shiloh and stuff like that. Like, so, so shouldn't the Torah have told us she skipped breakfast that day? <laughs> I'm not following. You know what she was wearing? Was no. she wearing high heels that day? Was she wearing flats? What was she? Dress, no. business, business attire? No. You don't know? No. no. Do you know if, if Hana was uh, talkative that day? Did she spend any time with anybody, have a conversation with anybody before? <laughs> you don't know. I, I don't not, know. We, it's not. I don't know saying, either. It's yeah. not. Why don't you know? I guess it's not relevant. It's not relevant. Uh -huh. So in other words, if the scripture didn't tell it to us, it's not relevant. We know Hannah's circumstances. We know that she was very unhappy. She was deeply unhappy. She didn't have a child. That was a weird situation. Sister wives. It's all together. It's something we have a hard time understanding. But the bottom line is, this other wife has lots of children. She has no children. She was very unhappy. That didn't have to be explained. Why did the scripture have to tell us the Yimaras Nefesh? When it describes the davening, it says it describes Chana and it tells you you should know the Yimaras Nefesh. Now ask yourself that simple question. Why was it necessary for scripture to tell us that? And remember that scripture is not simply a recapitulation or of a narrative, but rather it's something that's relevant for eternity. That's, the, that's how we view scripture. We view scripture as these are stories which actually happened, but these are stories <laughs> which are ever happening. And these are stories which, in which every single person till the end of time can find themselves and can find inspiration and can find and glean guidance. So you asked me a question about the Himaras Nefesh. After all, that was a matter of fact. But I'm pointing out to you that there were a number of things which are also matter of facts. She had to be wearing something. Shouldn't we know what she's wearing? A good storyteller would fill in those details. What was the weather like that day? Was it a gloomy day? Was it, was, it, was it overcast? And maybe that's why she was unhappy? Or was it a balmy, sunny day? It's not relevant. 
So the fact that the scripture chose to emphasize this is meaningful. It tells us something. That became a part of her prayer. Does that make sense? Not really, okay. but kind of. I'll accept it. <laughs> without, without getting fixated on whether or not you appreciate the proof from Chana or not, clearly the Mishnah tells it to us. So that's how our rabbis definitely saw it, whether they saw it from Chana alone or from other things, but they, they came to a certain conclusion that in order for a person to daven right, in Eindim Lehispal Elamitech Kevedresh, if you're going to daven right, it's going to be done out of seriousness. It's going to be done out of heavy headedness. It's going to be done out of contriteness. It's going to be done out of bitterness. That's the way it's going to be done. And it's a Mishnah. The Mishnah is the halacha. It's telling you, Ein Eindim. It doesn't say, if you'd like, here's a cute way to daven. Here's 10 davening tips. Well, I thought you have to be simcha. That was the question that's we're a, asking that's here. A, that's, that's the a, issue. They thought you have to be simcha. Here you have a Mishnah saying, Ein Eindim, Elometech Hevedresh. Here you have a Mishnah that says, Ein Eindim, Elometech Simcha. It doesn't say, here's an opportunity. You can daven joyously. That's nice. You can daven bitterly. bitterly. That's also nice. You know, the sweet and sour. It's nice ways to daven. Daven this way, daven that way. <coughs> you could not daven at all. You do whatever you want. And that's not really Judaism. Judaism is not really one of these electives, fuzzy, do whatever you want things. The Mishnah tells you, Ein Eindim. It says, you don't do this only. Save out of. It didn't tell you this is a way to daven. It says this is the only way to daven. That's a problem. That's a problem. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to add up. Like, or I can be B'Kevid Reish. I can be besimcha. I can't be both at the same time. Can't experience. I can't. I can't be bitter and joyous at the same time. I know what means a bad mood. We all do. We know what means a good mood. We all have good moods. We cannot be in good mood and a bad mood at the same time. You know, if you say, "Hey, how's your day going?" Eh, today is not great. Why not? Usually for no good reason, by the way. I'm there. I'm in a mood today. You're in a bad mood. Whatever. And some days you're in a good mood, and you don't even know why you're in a good mood. So. Those natural states of just being in a mood because you're in a mood is actually not what we're talking about. And you know why? Because anything that comes naturally and doesn't involve avoida, hard work, has nothing to do with serving Hashem. It's just existing. It's matter of fact. Matter of fact is not avoida Hashem. Avoida Hashem, serving Hashem comes when it's not matter of fact, but rather it's the circumstances I create and cause. It's the choices I make. Nobody gets credit for being. Well, I just happen to be that way, so what? But if I happen to be that way, then I don't get credit for it. So if somebody happens to be generous, doesn't mean they should become mean and capricious. It means they should be even more generous than it comes naturally. It's a gift to be naturally generous. Now you have to be even more generous than that. If somebody is naturally uh, tight-fisted, so they have an opportunity, it's easier for them to be generous in a way of avoid the show. Now when they break themselves and then they give five bucks to Tzedakah, maybe it's a bigger thing and somebody else gives $500 to Tzedakah, even though they have the same exact bank account. Why? Because this person is... Nebuch, sadly, a very tight-fisted individual. And it's a terrible way to live to be tight-fisted. It's a nice way to live to be generous and open, but that's a gift. Hashem gives us different personalities. Somebody's, that's his personality. That's his personality. So we all know that moods come and go, and we also know that we can put ourselves into a good mood. We can work on getting out of bad moods. You don't, you don't have to give in to depression. You don't have to give in to sadness. You don't have to give in to bitterness. You don't have to give in to moods. We, we largely have the ability to control our moods. We say, I'm not going to get down. I'm not going to be down about this. How do you do that? You refocus. You, you think about other things. You contemplate the kindnesses. You count your blessings. There are ways to do it. It doesn't even have to be a Yiddish guy thing. You know, there are a lot of people made a living off this, being motivational speakers, teaching people how to lift themselves out of the doldrums and put themselves into a better state. Granted, it's easier when you're in a good mood anyway, and it's harder when you're in a bad mood, but it's doable. The question or the issue here was not how to do that. That's discussed elsewhere. The question is how to experience both of these now, almost like back to back. That's the issue. I know you, you love the Maple Leafs. No, you're a big hockey fan. No? Patriots. The Patriots, sorry. I mixed up. <laughs> I, that's really bad, Nathan. I mixed up sport and team. <laughs> that's funny. Okay. The, the Patriots, did they win the Super Bowl this year? Last past year, yeah. Past year. They're, yeah. they're a really good team, though, right? They're excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Are they going to win the Super Bowl next year? Absolutely. Yeah? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I can't argue with you. I don't know anything about the Patriots. I really don't understand much about football. He's going to pray but for it. Here's the thing. 
is there's a good chance they might win. They might win the Super Bowl again. They're the favorites. This, they're the favorites. Vegas said so. Okay, there's a good chance they might. Is a chance they might not win, but they're definitely going to do well, right? Is there a chance that they will be the worst team in the NFL next year? Not a chance. Not a chance. <laughs> that wouldn't make any sense. How could you go from being Super Bowl champions, being the worst team? Somebody's going to have to occupy that position. Somebody will have to. Yeah. It's probably not going to be. It's not, not going to be New England. No, it's, not, it's just not going to be. But it doesn't mean in five years they won't get there. It doesn't mean in ten years they won't get there. They may become the worst team again. They are the worst team today. Could have been the best team twenty years ago. Hey, the Blue Jays won the World Series back to back. That was before I came here, right? That was, <laughs> that was a long time ago. Now they're very comfortable in the bottom of the heap these days. <laughs> so does it mean they'll never rise to the championship again? They'll rise. They'll get there. They could get there eventually. But these things usually don't happen in a snap. Yeah. Right? There's, the, like, there's a lot of stuff that happens this long. So you want to tell me that a person can go from one extreme to the other? That's, that's actually not normal. We would call that like a miracle. If, if, the, if the worst team became the championship a year later, it's like, how did that happen? Something doesn't make sense. But this is, this is not you know, sitting back and waiting for wild cards and the unexpected. This is, this is the everyday business of Avedi Hashem. So the everyday business of Avedi Hashem demands contriteness. The everyday business of Avedi Hashem demands joy. And it seems to demand them in a very small frame of time. And the question is, how do you do that? How do you do that? So the Alta Rebbe said, okay, you gave us a couple of hours in between. But that's really impractical. So he said, at least once a week before Shabbos. So the Rebbe once spoke about this, and he said, so what, what does it mean once a week before Shabbos? Are we suggesting that because Shabbos has an experience, uh, pardon me, an influence on the whole week, that if a person experiences this on Shabbos, it'll lift his whole week up. This is how many people tend to understand this. Shabbos is a prime influencer. The Zohar says, your name is Barchen Kuliyem. Shabbos is the day from which blessing issues forth for the whole week. So Shabbos is like a point of diffusion. Everything is elevated and transformed through Shabbos. So if we experience a proper Shabbat, the whole week is different. If we have an improper Shabbat, we suffer from it all week. And that's why Shmirat Shabbat is not just the difference of how we behave in one of the seven days of the week. Shmirat Shabbat is the difference of how we live all week. A Shomer Shabbat is a different kind of life. It's a different kind of life. I was sitting with somebody recently, and he said to me, you know, I'm under so much pressure, I do all these things. I, I, when, when things get really difficult for me, I just close my eyes, and I imagine myself in that, that beautiful, quiet beach in the white sand, and my feet are in the water, and I imagine myself drinking a, a martini, and this, I, this five minutes, says, and I get, and that's, that's how I, 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 I save myself. He said, says to me, um, I know you work very hard to learn pressure, what do you do? I said, you know, think I'm crazy, but I was never on a beach like that ever in my life. He goes, are you serious? You never go on such occasions? I said, no. He says, how do you stay normal? I said, how? I daven for an hour and a half every day. <laughs> I learned total for three or four, sometimes five hours a day. He goes, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I said, try it. You'll like it. I said, if you, if you would come every single morning and study Torah and then daven and then say till them and do all the things, you will also find it different. I said, you, you, find, you find a sense of equilibrium. You find a sense of that it grounds you. I really believe that. It's not, I'm not just saying that. It's really, it's really true. It really is life edifying. So this is true on a daily basis. And our sages say that tefillah, the davening, is like the Shabbos within each and every single day. But Shabbos, the holy day of Shabbat, is an exalted period of time that changes the whole week. When a person, for 26 hours, on a very literal level, shuts down all of his devices and isn't doing the same thing, you're not going through the same schedule, and you're not involved in the same intensity. You have a different, everything changes. Your clothing changes, your way of speaking changes. You say, good Shabbos. Nobody says, good Wednesday. Right? Nobody says, uh, yom, sh yom, yom Sheni Shalom. People don't so you greet people differently. Even the Amaretz, the Gemara says, any Meshach of Shabbos doesn't lie on Shabbos. We're a little bit more honest with ourselves. We, we, our speech is, is more cordial. We're not in a rush. The food changes, the schedule of when we eat changes, everything changes, everything changes. Every seven days, everything changes. And all the things that pressure us, and all the things that are brought to bear, that we have to deal with in contempt, all these things dissipate. It says, Shabbos is kol malach tucha asuya. All your work is done. And the famous question is, all your work is done? Is there anybody in the world who could ever say that all their work is done? There's always stuff left to be done. On Shabbos, it's ke'ilu. It says, if everything is, everything is sleepy now. Everything is at bay. 
there's no issues. It's not something today. Hang to Shabbos, they say. Don't talk, don't, I want to hear about it. Don't talk about it. Today is Shabbos. So when a person experiences that, that, that uh, it transforms them. It transforms them not only in Shabbos, it transforms the person's soul. It transforms the person's psyche. It changes your emotions. It, it, it means that every seven days, you're, 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 you're so to speak, you're able to air out. And, and, and that, that repairs us. I was once talking to somebody who's a regular smoker, and he's a big Talmud Chacham, and I said to him, you know, like, it's just wrong what you're doing. Like, there's all these, these tests and so on and so forth. Like, you're gonna get sick, you have to stop it. And he said to me, only, I, I don't believe what, he's, what, he said, what, he, what he said, by the way, about this, but it's very funny what he said, it's a very smart guy. He said to me, all the tests are done on people who smoke continuously. I stop every six days and I have a 26 hour hiatus. <laughs> says that my lungs have a chance to repair themselves. So okay, it's, it's an interesting, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it's true. <laughs> I'm not sure that filling your lungs with poison six days a week, not seven days a week is true, but, but he has a point. I mean, the, he has a point that may, maybe that one day does allow for at least some kind of repair. Maybe, maybe it minimizes the damage, right? Because when you, you're filling your lungs with the same garbage every single day and there's no interruption, maybe there is a difference. Now, whether it works with cigarette smoke, I don't know probably a bad idea anyway. But one thing is for sure, when we're absorbing all the pressures of life, and then there's one day a week where all of that is kept at bay, where we really observe Shabbos properly, which is not only in action, but in speech and even in thought, and yes, it makes a difference. It changes you, it's a transformative experience. So there are those who understood this, the Pshat here in Tanya, that al says, do your Tikkun Chatzos on Thursday night, but prepare for Shabbos properly. Have a, a Thursday night in which you're involved in spiritual pursuit, and then your Shabbos will be different. And if Shabbos is different, the whole week will be different. But then it comes out like this. The Rebbe said, if that's true, it turns out that the person who's doing this secondary form of Avedis Hashem, and he can't hack it every day. He can't do it on, 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 on a, he can't have the, the Kovid Reish before davening. So he's started the Kovid Reish six hours before. He's at, at Tikka Chatzais. Then we said, no, no, I can't do that every day. It's too intense, too hard, too, too overwhelming. Okay, fine. So you do it only once a week. Mm -hmm. So the person who's doing it once a week is at a higher madrega, a higher level than the person who's doing it every day. Why, that, why would you ask that? Because here's a, a person who's able to, he, he does, he has a proper Shabbos, and from Shabbos, the whole week changes. Yeah. So then why do it every day? It's like the tzaddikim g'daylim, you do it every day. Yeah. People are not big tzaddikim, you just keep Shabbos. Shabbos will take care of the rest, the rest will fall into place. It turns out that the person who's not the tzaddik, Seems to be at some higher level. He's able to pull this off through one ting chatzais, through one proper Shabbos davening, where everybody, all the tzaddikim, have to do it on a daily basis. No, more is expected of a tzaddik than a, than a regular person. I understand more is expected, but, but it seems sure. somehow, and, and it, it seems somehow the regular person is able to achieve the same kind of the inner equilibrium through doing this only once a week. And then I've asked one final question. So why did Dr. Rebbe add the words, Shabbos Isis Toshiv Enish? You shouldn't say Shabbos, I see it's Toshev. Toshev means return, which is the root of tshuva, and Shabbos is Shabbos. So Shabbos and Toshev, okay. Shabbat and Toshev, same. Like why, why Toshev Enosh? <coughs> Especially because we know that Enosh is the lowest form of humanity. The highest form of humanity is Adam, which means Adam, in the image of. And that speaks about a person who has excellence in the intellectual arena. And then it's called an Ish. An Ish is a real mensch. The person who is emotionally sound, and emotionally balanced and grounded and effective. And then there's called an Enosh. And the Enosh is a person, he's weak. He's weak, he's weak intellectually. He's weak emotionally. He's an Enosh. He knows how to behave like a mensch. He can at least, he's, he's, he can be respectful. He can be courteous. He can go through the motions. He's well-mannered. They call it Enoshiut. It's a mensch, menschlichkeit. He's okay. He's not a mensch, but he can behave menschlich. He can behave in a way which is decent. So this person who's an Enosh, who experiences weakness in the area of what a human being could be, it says that there's a person who's called Gever. You know what the, you know the Gever is? Like in, in Hebrew, say T, Gever, like literally be a man. It means like to, to use, to have strength and to have fortitude and courage and you know, get the job done. So the Gever works with the Enosh and he elevates the Enosh. The Gever is supposed to turn the Enosh into an Ish or an Adam. This is an idea in Hasid that's talked about in Yom Yom. But at any rate, Enosh is the lowest level. So here we're talking about somebody who can experience Shabbos in a sense of total rejuvenation, a sense of oneness with Hashem, 
And it says, Toshev Enish. Are you talking about the lowest level person? So therefore the Rebbe says, the point is this. Of course it's better to do this on a daily basis. Of course the tzaddik was able to do Tikkun Chatzais each and every single night. Of course he's on a higher level. Of course he's closer to Hashem. Of course he experiences that oneness more profoundly. Of course for him tefillah is a real state of joy and a real state of communion. Having said that, even a person who's in Enosh, even a person who's weak, even a person who spiritually does not have great achievement and accomplishment under their belt, even such a person could experience a sense of elation on Shabbos. Why? Because on Shabbos, everybody can daven differently. On Shabbos, everybody can be exalted. Even the Enosh can be Toshev. The Adam, the Ish, experiences a Shiva, a return to Hashem every day of his life, every day of the week. A regular person, a regular day of the week, is like, he can't even think straight. He's barely getting through his davening. But Shabbos, Shabbos, everybody can experience this. And that's what the Alter Rebbe goes on to say, because Shabbos is Aliyah Sa'ilamis. On Shabbos, the world is exalted. On Shabbos, existence itself is on a higher level. And because of this, because the world proverbially goes back to its source, we know that Hashem is constantly recreating the world with this idea, anthropomorphism of speech. And God is constantly speaking the world into existence, which means willing the world into existence. And then, on Shabbos, it goes back to its origin. It's like a, when a person is, is take, takes it easy, or like, you know, goes into a contemplative state. You're working, you're engaged, then you're drained, and you go into a contemplative state, a restorative state, where a person gets back to himself. So Shabbos, God, proverbially, every single week, on Shabbos, everything is exalted, everything is elevated, everything goes back to what it was. And because that's the case, and because God's constantly recreating the world, so the world that's being recreated is being recreated in a higher way. All of reality is different. And because we're living in a different reality, so we're closer to Hashem. The world around us is closer to Hashem. The world or life is usually defined by conflict, by challenges, by issues, by, by, by struggle. And on Shabbos, all of this dissipates. On Shabbos, the notion of having to struggle with one's desires kind of melts away. Shabbos is a day of delight. Shabbos is a day of pleasure. On Shabbos, you don't say to a person, make sure don't eat this or don't eat that. It's Shabbos, whatever. Like a, Shabbos, everything goes. On Shabbos, a person is allowed to let go and, and, and is not in, indulge, but because the indulgence doesn't bring you down. Indulging a whole week has a way of lowering a person. Indulging on Shabbos doesn't have that kind of effect. So on Shabbos, when everything is exalted, even the material reality of Shabbos is, who befrat tefillis of Shabbos, especially the davening of Shabbos. As I mentioned earlier, on a regular day, Shabbos experience, is experienced microcosmically through prayer. The hour or two of prayer is like the Shabbos of the week. In comparison with the 24 hours, the hour or two of prayer is like the Shabbos, the one, day of, the one unit of, of the seven days. So imagine if prayer is like Shabbos on a regular day, then imagine what prayer on Shabbos is like. It's the Shabbos of Shabbos. So Shabbos is not only about kishka and cholent. It's not only about chicken soup. It's not only about the Shabbos snooze. In fact, it's primarily about the davening of Shabbos. That's where the davening of Shabbos is much longer. That's why even people who can't get to show for, for, for a week, the, week, the weekday services will make an effort in getting to show for Shabbos. So Shabbos, which is tefillah, that's a higher level of tefillah. And because Shabbos is the, the Shabbos within Shabbos is the concept of tefillah on Shabbos, because of this, a person has to make sure that at least the Shabbos davening is appropriate. And since we said we need to have tshuva tato, the lower tshuva that precedes the tshuva law, so what has to happen first? Then there has to be a tikkun chatzais. Then there has to be that contriteness, or at least to recite Shema, the bedtime Shema, at least in a with serious contrite way on Thursday night in order to prepare for Shabbos. And in the yeshiva world, Thursday night is not a regular night. Students, yeshiva students don't go to sleep on Thursday night. All my adolescent years, I was up learning Torah all night Thursday night. Thursday night, everybody knows, is a special night. When you experience a, a, a more spiritually exalted night on Thursday night by studying Torah and for bringing, then come Shabbos, then you can experience a proper Shabbos. <laughs> so Shabbos is about preparing for it. And preparing doesn't only mean to go shopping. It doesn't only mean to shine your shoes. It means to make sure that you're prepared in a spiritual way. There was once a man in Lubavitch. And he was running around just before Shabbos looking for shoe polish. So the Mechal Blina, this elder Chassid, saw the man and he looked up agitated and he said, what's, what's wrong? What are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for shoe polish. I need shoe polish to polish my shoes for Shabbos. So the Mechal said, here in Lubavitch, we polish our heads. 
Na der Schüssel schauen. Das ist eine gute Frage. Und das ist, was die Thursday Night ist. Ich habe eine Frage. Ich wollte sagen, dass sie eine Frage ist, eine Frage für eine Woche in der Woche in der Woche. Also, du bist bereit, oder? Ja. Und Thursday ist Optimum? Thursday Night. Thursday Night, ja. Thursday Night. So, and uh, people who are, who are not getting much sleep to begin with, I don't know if it's a good idea to knock yourself out Thursday night also, but the point is Thursday night should be a different kind of night. Mm -hmm. Thursday night should be added, an added spiritual preparation, added rung of spiritual preparation, because if we prepare properly before Shabbos, then we'll have Shabbos. It's like that in a material sense, it's certainly like that on a spiritual level. And here Dalton Ever concludes in the chapter in the bracket of a saying, Bizei Yuvim, with this will understand, Mashakosov, what says in the scripture, Shuve Eli, return to me, Ki Goel Ticha, because I have redeemed you. But l'chayda, that doesn't make sense. Shuve lie, the Pasuk says, kiz mechisik so apshaecha, that I erased all of your sins, and gel ticha, I have redeemed you from your sin. Pirosh, so me'ach hasha mechisik so apshaecha, since I took away all your sins, just like a cloudy day, and, I, and it, all the clouds blow away. Hashem says, all the things that are separating you from sunlight, meaning like proverbially Hashem, I blow away all the clouds, now it becomes a sunny day. So if that's the case, if, if, the, if, the, if the sin is gone like the clouds, and it's Havar Sasitra Achra, Hashem said, take away the negative forces. Gal Ticha I saved you, I redeemed you from the Chitzeinim, from the extraneous forces of, of reality. And that's what happens, B'Seder Asach Merab Melyenim, with an arousing, a stirring of great mercy. You, you brought this about through your reaching out to Hashem. And because you reached out to Hashem in bitterness and shame over your sin, in a desire to, to, to release of no shackles, to shake off the dust, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I cleanse you and I elevated you. So what does the Navi say? Shuva Eli, come back home. Come back home, I am home, what do you mean? The whole reason I wasn't home, but the separate from God was my sins. But he just said, everything was wiped away. You just said Hashem removed all the sins. So if Hashem removed all the sins, what's Shuve Eli? So the answer is, as we said earlier, Azai Shuve Eli, but Shuve Tatoa. Now you erst come. Now you really start to come back to Hashem. Because everything talked about before is Shuve Tatoa, the lower form of Shuve. That sin, as it actually serves as a barrier, as a, as a partition between us and Hashem. As we said earlier, like, a, like an iron curtain. So sin necessarily distances us from God. So when we finally got rid of sin, and when we finally were able to absolve the sin, and we absolved that to doing tshuva, to experience regret and remorse and resolve and all those good things, which is tshuva tato, then Hashem says, tshuva elai, now come home to me. Now come home to me. Now is experiencing Yiddishkeit in a much deeper, much more profound, much more intense way. And this idea of the higher form of tshuva, which we have now understood, means to pray properly. And earlier we talked, it means to study more intensely and to get darker in a greater measure. So when a person does these things in a greater measure, in a higher form, that becomes tshuva ilah, the higher form of tshuva, which is only experienced after the tshuva tata. And with this we complete chapter 10. Be